Let us welcome our guests. Uh, it is a team of five people, or we have five people from the Splunk documentation team here today. And we're going to hear a short introduction from Chris, and then we're going to launch into the lightning talks from uh, four of the people on the team. So I will hand it over to Chris when Chris is ready. Thanks so much. Um, thank you, Alyssa and Andrea, for inviting us. Thank you all for joining us. So we're here tonight to share a little bit of the product is Docs, uh, which is, as some of you know and some of you don't, based on the poll, is the book that the Splunk Doc team wrote about making Docs in a product development organization. The book, uh, the book contains 25 short article style chapters, which are organized alphabetically. You can read them in any order. You can choose your own adventure. You can share them with colleagues. But like, why did we write this book in the first place? And th the answer is, uh, in our own research and investigation on various topics, uh, we kept coming up short, uh, not finding the answers we wanted to find. Uh, whether we were looking for information about audience definitions or cross-functional collaboration or even doing docs in Agile, which there are a lot of materials about, we didn't find things that really seemed to match what our lived experience was on the Splunk doc team. So uh, the product is docs was a group effort from day one. Uh, at this point, there are 30 current and former Splunkers who contributed to it. And we started it as a Hack Week project. Literally during a Hack Week, we brainstormed a bunch of topics and assigned them out. And the goal was at the end of the week, we should have a very rough first draft. And we did. And then we did peer reviews and a bunch of iterations. And that led to the publication. And then over the couple of years after that, as time passed and our practices and our tools evolved, uh, we identified some new topics that we hadn't covered. Uh, there are some updates we wanted to make. We thought of some things we left out. Uh, and so we uh, added some chapters and revised a bunch of chapters. And that led to the second edition. Uh, very fortunately for us, right in the process of that second edition development, there was a fantastic Write the Docs book club discussion in the Write the Docs Slack at the beginning of 2020. And so we were able to incorporate a bunch of feedback from those discussions into the second edition. Uh, so we sell the book on Amazon. We always have and continue to donate all the royalties to a variety of nonprofit organizations. And we welcome, welcome community engagement, feedback, discussion about the book, which is why we're so thrilled to be here with you tonight. So now we'll turn to the lightning talks about the content and development process of parts of the book. So this is a sampling of chapters that includes some from the original edition, some that were revised for the second edition, and some that were new. And we'll just start off and I'll turn it over to Matt Ness. Yeah, so hi. Um, I'm, I'm Matt Ness. I'm a principal tech writer at Splunk. I've been there for uh, well over a decade at this point. And uh, I wrote a topic on working with user experience and design. So it's been a while since we put the first edition of the book together. And to be honest, there are bits of it that I had forgotten. It's interesting how you can read something you wrote years earlier and be stunned afresh by a weighty little nugget of wisdom. Who said that amazing thing? Oh, wait, I said it, or rather, I quoted it. In this case, I'm referring to the line about how products sometimes get designed from the inside out rather than the outside in. This incisive bit of knowledge science was dropped by a UX design consultant who turned out to be just passing through my company at the time. When she said it, I think I reeled, like literally, because that kind of thinking perfectly described some of the design train wrecks we were struggling with at that time. And it was just good to hear someone say the words, the designing from the inside out rather than the outside in. Now, I don't want you to get the impression that all my interactions with UX at my career, in my career have been, without exception, some form of trench warfare. No, far from it. I've had lovely and productive relationships with Splunk UX designers and UX engineers that go back years. And I say that when I'm working with those people on those projects, life is pretty sweet. But then, you know, there are those other cases that stand out. Sometimes people forget they're building things for people to actually use. I mean, they work, 
they work great from their perspective. They've got their feature precisely sorted so that all the data and all the transactions are flowing swiftly through the network architecture from A to Z. They've got the Vivo Fetzer process syncing up to the What's It Sauce service and running Foop de Bois routines and the external Grundle Schlossen at, at rates heretofore unheard of. And it's an engineering marvel, but the UI is ridiculous and the user workflow collapses halfway through and the terminology is a mystery wrapped in an enigma. And the leads on the team look at this confusion and just kind of wave their hand and say, oh, we'll just call that out in the docs. When I wrote this chapter, I wanted writers to know they're empowered to deal with that kind of thing. Empowered not just to participate in the UX design process, but to actually make the product they're documenting easier to use. Tech writers always aren't always invited to UX design reviews. And when they are, they're not always encouraged to speak up. And even when they speak up, it can take a while for them to be heard, but that's our job. In many cases, it may be on us to advocate for the user, even if it doesn't seem like your developers and designers want to hear it, they need to hear it. So to that end, look for ways to fix weird UI so you don't have to spend your day and nights trying to explain it with words. Identify confusing terminology and change it. Work with your people to demystify mysterious UX interactions, those magic button solutions that often end up being more trouble than they're worth. Help your UX team to not reinvent existing workflows unless that is their goal. Attend, and if it comes to it, organize UX design workshops. And most of all, speak up. We're not here to just sit quietly and take notes. We're here to help customers get the user experience they deserve. And that's my piece. Um, I'll pass it on to Mike Clauser. Hello, my name is Mike, and I am a technical writer at Splunk. And tonight I will be talking about the customer feedback and community chapter. An open and active customer community is essential in today's crowded software and services environment. And a big part of the Splunk documentation brand is how motivated we are to gather and respond to feedback from our user community. Actively interacting with your organization's user community gives you the opportunity to engage with the people who are actually using the product and your documentation. And at Splunk, when we refer to our product's community, we refer to all active users of the Splunk software. This means customers, internal users, and external users. And the conversations that documentarians have with these stakeholders and the attention that is paid to them comprises a key part of effectively working with our product's user community. And you can use a variety of methods to do this. Each organization has a different method of effectively working with their users community, but every single method, every successful method is rooted in transparent, open-minded communication. And that's because feedback, especially the angry negative pieces of feedback, is almost never about the documentation writer personally. So if slash when you receive negative feedback, take it seriously, but don't take it personally. We also get feedback that isn't angry hate mail. In fact, we receive a lot of good feedback that is appreciative of our content. But whether feedback is good, bad, or neither good nor bad, this engagement is critical for both your organization as well as your users. So when you receive feedback, acknowledge the frustration, make an offer to assist when you're able, and, re and remain in contact. Offer the customer the opportunity to end the conversation. And as you collect feedback, try to look and listen for patterns that help improve your documentation. Do certain obstacles come up again and again? And once you've collected that feedback, it is important to use the same communication processes internally as you would externally. 
This means actively sharing your external interactions internally with stakeholders from your organization, be it UX designers, engineers, and product managers. And that's because of proactive and continuous effort to work with the Splunk user platform user community is critical for us for producing quality content. Thank you uh, for taking the time to listen to this topic. And with that, I would like to introduce Jesse Evans. Hi, everyone. I'm Jesse Evans. I'm a technical editor on the Splunk Docs team. And I collaborated with the three other technical editors on the Splunk Docs team to write the chapter of the book on technical editing. But before we get into tech editing, I want to take a second to say that technical writers do a lot as evidenced by the number of chapters in the book where we talk about the many, many things we do in order to write technical documentation. Technical editing is where we get, it, we get to talk about the writing part of technical writing. The writing and the docs we deliver are the place where all of these things in the book come together. All of those conversations with our customers, those meetings with our PMs, stand-ups with our developers, at the end of the day though, our job is to write something. And technical editing gives us the chance to ask if what we've written says what we want it to say. So the editors on the Splunk Doc team have defined technical editing as the process of giving feedback to technical writers about the effectiveness of their content. It's the process of helping technical writers evaluate if their content meets the goals they set for it because Technical writing is so much more than copy editing. My brilliant colleague, Alyssa Yell, one of the other editors on the Splunk Docs team, likes to say that we offer bespoke editing services. Instead of an edit request where the person requesting the edit asks for a general edit, we ask the person to tell us what they want us to edit for. For example, we might work with a writer on evaluating whether or not their content is user-centric, review their content for compliance with the style guide, or give them feedback on their topic titles. And we like to think of technical editing as collaborative, not corrective. So we also work with writers upstream of their writing and may work with them on figuring out what the goals of their content are. And there's a chapter in the book on learning objectives where we talk about figuring out the purpose of your content. And you don't need editors to do these things. You can work with a peer, a fellow writer, and you can do it yourself. Um, and we've included a self-editing checklist in the book to help you do it. So whether you work on a large documentation team that has editors or you're the lone technical writer for a small startup, look for ways to get feedback on your content. Um, feedback is an important part of what makes Splunk, Splunk documentation tick. Uh, because we know continuous feedback leads to continuous improvement. One final thing here, feedback is data. When you get feedback, you get data that can help you make decisions about your writing. And we're in an age of data-driven decisions. So it's, 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 always a good uh, it's always the right time to get feedback to make your documentation effective. And with effective documentation, you can help your customers be successful with your products. Thank you. And I'll uh, hand it over to Jennifer. Hello, everyone. I'm Jennifer, and I'm going to discuss the writing sauce documentation chapter and its development using extreme programming pair writing techniques. For background, I learned pair writing during my time at Pivotal Cloud Foundry. The uh, engineers use XP pair programming, which is two people at a workstation. One person writes code while the other person reviews it, and they frequently switch roles. This technique is an effective way to uh, quickly produce a work product because people generally speak faster than they type. They speak at about 140 words per minute versus 40 words per minute for typing. And the close collaboration gives you immediate feedback. So pairing when you're developing code or documentation or really anything also minimizes the need for asynchronous reviews and testing. Now the writing saws documentation chapter was a new addition to the book. Lila Johnson was the lead primary writer and I was a secondary collaborative writer, contributing writer. When I spoke to Lila about this new chapter, it turns out that 
Uh, she was facing the classic writer's dilemma of a blank page, a looming deadline, and a million other things to do. I suggested that we use pair writing, and she was game, so we dove in. For our first session, I put Lila at the keyboard, uh, and I acted as a facilitator because I knew my questions would trigger information from her. We focused on clearly defining the project plans, such as the writers, the deadlines, available resources, and our contingency plans. And we also developed a robust chapter outline. Uh, Lila had experience with uh, the Splunk on-premises and cloud products. So she wrote the first section on the unique needs of SaaS customers. Um, I have experience, I wrote the second section on being a SaaS writer working in fast-paced agile companies. Shane Divin wrote the third section on the importance of internal runbooks in SaaS environments. And Tracy Carter contributed to primarily the first and second sections. Most of the content was pulled together within a week. Uh, I had a few pairing sessions with Lila and one pairing session with Tracy. We then finished up some final edits through asynchronous Google Doc reviews. By collaborating, we achieved our goal of a completed chapter that was ready for an editorial review by the deadline. Two important tips. During pair writing, it's very important to use a recording device. Perfectly crafted sentences will fall out of your mouth and you will forget them as soon as they pass your lips. If you're using um, Zoom with its audio transcription feature, you can say something like bookmark phrase and then pull that great sentence from the audio transcript and put it right into your doc. Another thing to do is to read your content out loud, whether you're pairing or not. You'll hear the awkward or rough places in the content. It's like driving a car. When the content works, it's like driving over a smooth road. When it doesn't work, it's like rolling over the gravel in the breakdown lane. That's my lightning talk. Thanks very much. And now back to Andrea. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, everybody. Um, I figured I'd, I'd revisit some of the comments that uh, people have left in the chat window. Um, and also mention again that if you do have any questions for things that have come up, um, let me get through the comments first, but then do feel free to put them into the chat window and then speak up um, when I've gone through those comments. So um, if we scroll back a little bit, I've got a comment from Douglas uh, who shared a link to Matt Ness's presentation from the Write the Docs conference in 2015. Uh, it's pretty awesome. And um, we have a couple comments from Chuck and uh, Tony about uh, the fact that uh, technical editor roles even exist in this world. Um, and I did want to ask a little bit more about that, but um, let me take a second here and, and uh, see if anybody does want to pop in with any questions before I steamroll. Any questions, anybody? Okay, so. Um, Sorry, question. Yes, 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 Sarah. So, so they're talking about the second edition of this book. Is there an ETA one that will be available? Oh, the second edition is uh, is already published. It's actually been out for a year. Okay. So if you if you look for the product with docs, that's what you'll find. Okay, thank you. Sure, thanks for asking. Oh, any other questions? I just bought it. <laughs> <laughs> I had the first edition on the go, and I just bought the second edition. Um, so I, I was just joking with with Chris, uh, with Chuck about the editor thing because um, I'm in a company now where we have two technical editors, which are absolutely awesome. But I have worked in as a sole writer before, and having to edit your own work is a pain in the butt because you don't have that person at the fore end to help you to collaborate and to to get you kick get you kick started in writing something. So you get faced with that blank page all the time. So yeah, that's what we were joking about the whole left brain right brain thing. <laughs> I read it as a joke, but it's also just so very true because I know, I mean, I, I've been working as a technical writer for just a couple of years, but I know um, I'm far from alone in being one of the lone writers in our community. And I don't know, I guess I, I would like to ask uh, Jesse some more or just sort of poke her brain about um, um, how exactly the team has defined uh, the difference in roles between editor and writer. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, uh, on the point of um, uh, the rarity of technical editors 
um, in our industry, um, the Write the Docs meetup uh, group, or sorry, excuse me, the Write the Docs um, Slack uh, group uh, that Chris mentioned at the beginning that um, did our did the product as docs as a book club. Uh, I believe one of the comments um, when they read the technical editing chapter was that uh, technical editors are as mythical as unicorns. Um, so um, it, it does seem to be that it's, that it's a bit rare, um, but. Um, on uh, sort of um, the distinction between writers and editors, um, it's a good question. We um, we have um, you know, four of us who are technical editors, and um, the rest of the team is our, our writers um, and and some doc managers um, and Chris. Um, but the writers are typically embedded with their um, dev teams. They're um, going to stand up meetings. They're, um, you know, they have specialty um, and um, subject matter expertise in their product areas or feature areas that they're documenting. And they um, uh, uh, typically will send um, their content to us in, in editing and we will, we will edit it. Um, uh, we, but we also do a lot of um, collaboration. Um, and we also encourage, um, you know, like, uh, peer editing if it's po if possible. So there's a lot of information in um, the technical editing chapter about um, uh, if you are the sole technical writer at your company or if you do have the opportunity to do uh, peer editing um, to um, uh, some, some tactics and um, practices about doing technical editing um, regardless of whether or not you are a technical editor um, or get to work with a technical editor, you're doing a peer edit or um, you're doing it yourself as a sort of self edit. Um, but yeah, so we have we have editors and writers, and typically the editors um, we're we're sort of generalists. We're trained on the um, the products um, just as the writers are, but we don't have the um, area of you know specialization in the particular areas that the writers do. I see. Okay, I, I have a question, but before I get to my own question, let me pop in this question that Chuck has posted. Um, he's asked, as a technical editor, do you use and recommend Carolyn Rood's book? What is Carolyn Rood's book? <laughs> uh, Carolyn Rood wrote the book called Technical Editing. Um, uh, we do use that book. Um, it actually is a book that I use as a textbook in my technical editing uh, tech writing class as part of my coursework for um, my degree in technical editing. Um, but that was a very long time ago. Uh, one of our editors is currently taking um, a, a technical editing class um, for career enrichment um, through UC Berkeley, uh, sorry, UC San Diego, um, uh, a sort of a skill sharpening class. And I'm pretty sure they're using that, that textbook for that coursework. Okay, very cool. Um, I, had, I had a question that I wanna slip in before we start to ask um, some of the other speakers to, to answer some questions. But I noticed that you, uh, Jesse and Mike spoke quite a bit about feedback. Um, and I'm assuming that like you're each talking about feedback from different, um, <laughs> different, I, I'm not, I'm losing my words here. Um, Jesse, I'm guessing like you're dealing more with feedback um, from stakeholders or even um, between writers. Um, Mike, I think you're dealing more with feedback from the user community, but I'm wondering if you ever find yourselves um, collaborating in your day to day or not really. You mean between technical editing feedback and um, technical writer feedback? Sorry um, for the... Oh, no, no, that's thank you. No, I should have um, clarified um, between technical editing feedback and user community feedback that might impact um, edits or um, updates that you need to make to the documentation? Um, I'm happy to, to speak to this um, uh, a little bit. We, I think you heard um, you know, uh, a lot about feedback. Um, I think mm -hmm. Chris talked about it, <laughs> Matt was talking about it, Michael talked about it, I talked about it. Um, uh, we really have this, we harbor this culture of feedback um, uh, at Splunk. Um, one of Splunk's core values is um, openness. Um, so um, we're, we're very open to feedback and sort of whatever form that comes in. Um, feedback from our customers, um, like Mike was talking about. Um, feedback from editing. Um, uh, every time we on editing get, um, get to work with and collaborate with writers, we get feedback on our editing style and what works for them and what doesn't. Um, we do a survey to see um, you know, how it's going for everyone. Um, so just that harboring that culture of feedback is something that um, is sort of part of our practice and how we work. Um, 
uh, so there's a lot of sources and I don't want to say like, it's all feedback all the time. And <laughs> cause you know, like I was saying, we do a lot. There's so many things we have to do, um, uh, to produce documentation, um, that, um, you know, it's, it, it, and agile is sort of always moving forward, always looking forward. So, um, it's hard to say, oh, we gotta, you know, take time and revise things or look back and, and do things better. But, um, you know, it's iterative. A lot of, a lot of our writers work in a um, CICD um, environment. So they're iterating on their content. And even if we get feedback um, uh, that we can't change right away um, or that we might not have time to incorporate um, because we have a re really fast release cadence or something like that, um, you know, we're, we're taking that with us and we might be able to iterate it on in, in the next release um, or the next update or something like that. Um, so it does sound like a lot, but, um, you know, it's, it's part of the process. Yeah. And there are plenty of times where I have, um, leveraged, uh, editor consults in order to help, um, add clarity based on feedback that users have, um, responded with that there have been times where they've said, where, you know, feedback will say, you know, it's not clear enough or, things along those lines or things and it has been extremely helpful to have uh editors to help add a, either even just a fresh set of eyes on a particular piece of content um, but there are definitely times where i have leveraged our editing team to act on documentation feedback um, for a variety of reasons um, and to a variety of benefits. Yeah, the only thing I'll add just to say, as you probably gathered, Splunk docs are never done. So in, in some senses, it's always a moving target, but I think you know, when writers engage directly with editors, uh, it's either you know very early in the process when everything's a moving target and they want that consultative engagement that Jesse talked about, uh, or if it's that more kind of, uh, classic copy edit or or uh like style and style fit and finish edit then we we want to like reduce how much the content is changing at that point but customer feedback comes in when it comes in and and we always want to respond to that promptly very cool um we do have a couple more oh yes i just mm -hmm. wanted to share my experiences as being somebody who joined splunk recently um, and took advantage of the technical editing the group of people, which was tremendously to my benefit. Um, I was stuck trying to decide the best way of presenting some information. And I worked back and forth with an editor and got a lot out of it that I otherwise would have just been stuck doing. So it's very valuable to have somebody with a, with a, who I trust, first of all, and somebody who has a great perspective to sort of to, to look at what I'm trying to do and say, why don't you try this instead? That worked really well for me. Um, within my group, we often do the, the copy editing things and the, oh, you got this wrong, technically things we do between ourselves. So we don't always go to the technical editors to, to do that, but at the higher level things that, that you know, we probably don't have very much expertise on, the first thing I would do is go to a technical editor. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Um, let us uh, maybe bombard Jennifer with a couple questions before we get into the breakout sessions. Um, Kayla had asked if, uh, if you've had any experience pair writing with a developer, Jennifer. Took, yes, hi. Um, I, did, <laughs> I did pair at Pivotal Cloud Foundry with a few developers just a few times. Um, most of the time I was pairing with other members of the doc team or sometimes we would even do something called mobbing where there's one person at the keyboard and there's two, three, four or more people uh, contributing to the writing. So yes. Thanks. That's neat. I, I was just curious um, at uh, my workplace, we have a couple of developers who have uh, kind of strong opinions on documentation, especially uh, code samples and stuff like that. Um, and I've just found as a lone tech writer with that group um, that just getting a few of them just to bounce ideas has been really useful. So 
I'm glad to hear that um, it's not a unique practice. And I think it's awesome that you're talking more about it. I'm very curious to check it out. Thanks. <laughs> Anytime. Yeah. I mean, maybe you could mob with them, you mm -hmm. know, get them mobbing and then, you know, see how that works. Yeah, I also wanted to say thanks, Jennifer, for just like giving a few but like very practical tips for um, how to go about pair writing, like recording the sessions and realizing that, of course, we speak so much faster than we're able to write. So um, I guess that's just a great scenario for pair writing to come in. Um, yeah, I mean, so I'm just going to read a couple more things that people have asked or shared in our chat. Uh, we might not necessarily have any um, answers for them. But um, Will, a little while back, had, had asked if it would be possible for a future meetup to get a live demo of pair writing for a simple topic. And I think that's a great idea. We will figure out if we can organize something like that. Um, and Sri has asked um, if you all set aside time each week from your work schedules or meetings to work together on the book, and how, how supported was this project by, by Splunk? Um, well, so we, as I said, we, we started at a hack week when uh, every everyone in the development group was uh, not having the regular meetings and, and doing hack week projects. So uh, I think for total person hours spent, that was probably the highest concentration was was in that week that, that was sort of set aside for it. Uh, and after that, it it became the like a hobby project uh, that people kept working on and when we did the second edition there was there was no hack week to start it out so it was done uh, in addition to the regular work but I and the rest of the managers on the team you know really tried to work with the writers to prioritize so that they could set the time aside to work on it and not have to do it in the you know in the 14th hour of a 10 hour day or something like that uh, in terms of the larger organizations supporting it, uh, I don't think I asked anybody about it. Um, it. Just seemed like a good idea and something we wanted to do, and it was kind of the school play model, right? Like some, someone brought the ladder and someone brought the paint, and we put on a show. Uh, but a lot of things get done at Splunk uh, that way, uh, even still. And uh, you know, I just I'm always so grateful to the team and for all the as I said, the, the 30 people who, who really did invest uh, a lot of time and passion and knowledge in, into the project. And uh, I don't think there's, there's ever a way to completely set aside the time to do something like this. But uh, everyone, everyone that I've talked to who worked on the book certainly found it rewarding. And uh, it was just a pleasure to be able to work on it with everyone and offer this back to the community. So oh, um, I think I am going to ask one last question, uh, if that's okay with you, Alyssa, before we get into our breakout rooms. And Andre, who is here in LA, uh, he asked how writing a book was different from writing documentation, because you can imagine that there's some overlap. And if I remember correctly, Andre, you're um, a researcher, a scientist researcher over at uh, Caltech. I'll say one thing just to start off. Uh, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's 24 short, 25 short chapters. So it was, it's not a book with a thesis. It's not, uh, there's no through line uh, that, that combines uh, all of these chapters together. Uh, it's, a, it's a set of posts on a theme. So uh, from my own experience working on the book and, and writing some of the content, uh, it was more like writing a blog than um, writing technical documentation. Cool. No, um, thank you everybody for the questions. Um, I'm going to turn the baton back to Alyssa to help us uh, get into the breakout.